happen. Looks like it's working. Yes. Okay. So, um, oh, uh, someone's asking to share the Zoom link too. Uh -huh. uh, I can do that. Is it okay if I copy and paste the Zoom link? Okay, I pasted it. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I'll get started then. Um, so, um, okay, I'm going to try to monitor people coming into the room. So, um, this workshop is all about the history of word lists. I know it sounds incredibly compelling, but surprisingly, it does have some interesting elements to the story. Um, so, uh, let's just get started with what will be inside the presentation. So for the presentation today, um, we're just going to start with a quick demonstration about word lists. Then we're going to look at an overview of corpora. Then we're going to look at the history of word lists. And finally, we'll look at my top recommendations for resources online, seeing as we are working with online delivery right now. Um, so let's just get started with the demonstration. So I've just got a question here, and that question is, how do you make a word list? Um, let's say we need a word list for an upcoming class. And this class will help instructors who are less familiar with English as an additional language um, or language instruction um, prepare before they start teaching. Okay, so they're going to start teaching next week and you're going to help them prepare for this. Um, and what I'd like you to do is in groups of four or five, if you could take five minutes to create a list of maybe the five to 10 most important vocabulary words for these instructors to study before they start teaching. Okay, so what, do, what words do they as an instructors need to know before they start? And if you have time, rank them in order. You know, what's the most important word uh, English language instructor needs to know down to number 10. Okay, so um, we'll put you into breakout rooms. Um, should I do that or? Yes, you can. And just discuss with your partners for five minutes. You know, again, five, five important words for teaching English as an additional language. Okay. Apologies for the te technical difficulties there. Yeah, uh, I'm glad we were able to get it started. I'm not uh, sure what happened, but we we rolled with it. We rolled with it. Okay. Um, and thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Uh, okay, with the corpora. Okay, so uh, right, so back to the corpora. So after, hmm? okay, sorry. Let me know if there are any technical issues. Now I'm a little gun shy. <laughs> um, so after the, uh, that first corpora, corpus sort of came out and there were others of course, but that was the primary one. We then came out with the BYU corpora and these are great. You know, this is really when we started to get into the swing with computers and processing data. So the British National Corpus is now the more common one there. Uh, in Canada, we have the Strathy Corpus. I'm not super familiar with that one. Um, you know, but if you're interested in Canadian English, definitely check it out. All it is, again, is just a collection of text. Some of them you can search easily. Some of them don't. Um, there's a Wikipedia corpus. So if you want to analyze the text that is in Wikipedia, this is definitely an option for you. We also have a corpus of American soap operas, Time Magazine corpus. Uh, I think it's more because it's easy to analyze and look through these, right? They already have it accessible. Um, and of course, my number one favorite, you might have heard of this one before, the corpus of contemporary American English otherwise known as COCA. And I will talk more about COCA more towards the end of the presentation. 
So these are all created by BYU and they are usually accessible if you want to go search them out. Maybe you're curious about soap opera language. Um, but again, these are just collections of text, so not as usable, but they are normally the first step in the creation of a word list. So that brings us to the history of a word list. So let's first think about these big word lists. And now, uh, if you can type in the chat or you can just speak out if you want, what do these different you know, acronyms or initialisms stand for? Some of them are pretty easy. Uh, what is GSL? Does anyone know? Okay. Yes, general service list. That's right. Um, so that is really the first word list that was really used in English language instruction. <laughs> now, the less commonly known, UWL. Someone guess, guesses this one will be impressive. So this one is the university word list. Then, of course, the AWL, I would say probably the most famous word list. Yeah, people, right away. That's right, academic word list. And these two uh, ones at the bottom, you, you might not know because they are new. And the NGSL is the new general service list. We're really creative here. And then, of course, AVL, the academic vocabulary list. Of course, they had to make it different than the academic word list. So um, let's look at all of these lists and sort of, you know, I, I like the history of this because it's a bit more interesting than you would expect. So let's start off with the, the number one, the basic, you know, grandfather to all word lists, which is the general service list. This was created by Michael West in 1953. So I want you to think about how much they use computers back then in 1953 and think about how easy it would be to analyze text for things like frequency, spread, and so on. It's not as you know, not as easy to do. And I really do have a lot of respect for this project because of how much work it really involved. And he created a list of 2000 words and it was based on the most frequent words from a corpus. Um, now we're starting to see, however, that there were issues with this list and not just because it was handmade, that doesn't necessarily mean it's worse. But for example, he excluded words that other words in the list could function as. So for example, if we had open, he wouldn't have included a synonym for open because you wouldn't need it according to the way that they thought. So, you know, really you can already start to see some subjective thinking there. Say, well, this word can have a few jobs, so I'm gonna pick this other word. Um, he split it into K1 and K2, the first and second thousand. And it also is the source of the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English. It's built off of this word list. However, you know, these days people do have some criticisms of this general service list. For example, it has some archaic words like hurrah, shilling, madden, probably not high in your list of things that students really need to study right now. It also has some odd words like wheat and wiseness. And, you know, this sort of brings into question, you know, these ones are obvious, but maybe there are other words on that list that also don't deserve to be there, especially given the fact that this was created in 1953. Of course, computer is not on that list, but most of us would accept that it's more important. They also didn't really think about word families during the creation of this list. Hope is there, hopefully is not, but pride and proud are two separate headwords on the same list, right? So it gets a little bit confusing there. And finally, it's criticized for using qualitative criteria, criteria such as ease of learning and necessity, right? Again, it goes back to it being highly subjective. It's hard to assess that for, you know, it's sort of reliability these days. Um, so these are all reasons why the general service list is starting to lose traction. Um, however, it is still used everywhere, and you may not know that, but a lot of textbooks use the general service list 
as sort of the foundation because we've been using it for decades, right? Why would we, why would we stop? And I really, you know, have trouble judging them for that because it's really ingrained in how we teach. Now, the less popular one, uh, the university word list, but this is the precursor to the AWL, was created by Shui and Nation in 1984. So this is when we started to get computers going. This one has word families, unlike the previous list, which just had words, right? So they started to think about word families when generating the list. And um, they focused on it by saying, okay, if it's in the GSL, we're not going to put it in our list. So this list was founded, its foundation is based on the GSL first. And it's sort of interesting, this one, and this is just backstory, people don't really use it, but you know, they had two lists from Corpora and also to create this list, they tracked student annotations in textbooks, which I found very interesting. So, you know, they said, what are students likely to write about? That must make it more academic. Um, but it was criticized for having quite the small corpora compared to, you know, Coxens. So that brings us to, of course, the celebrity, a new academic word list by Avril Coxhead, um, created in 2001. And at this point, we really were getting quite proficient with computers. And Unlike the previous word list, this one has only 570 words. So it's very achievable. It feels very doable for a lot of students and instructors. It has a corpora with a source of 3.5 million words. Okay, so we're starting to increase the size of what we're analyzing. Compared to 1953, again, where they were hand counting words. Here we've got this big list. Unfortunately, it also follows the UWL's habit of excluding words from the general service list. So it, it, it again gave weight and importance to the general service list. If something is there, then I won't put it in the academic word list. And as you might know, it focused on sort of what we call tier two vocabulary, where it's not used in general speaking, it's just used in an academic context. But people are starting to question the AWL because of um, the deficiencies in the GSL, again, upon which it's founded. Um, its exclusion of the first 2000 words really makes us question, you know, well, did you take a look at those words? Should it maybe be included? Um, is, is this being recorded still? I just got a message about not being able to join, but if it's recorded, that'd be helpful. Anyway. Uh, yes, it's being recorded. Oh, it is being recorded. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so the, the list has been criticized as being biased towards some fields because of the data collection methods with which focused on law and economics, right? So less of a focus on psychology, sociology, and so on. And if you might have noticed it, um, you know, oh, a lot of these words are very specific and, and that, that would often be wise. That's sort of what they focused on. And also it's questioned for its inclusion of um, unacademic words, such as drama, job, and adult, where some would consider that more general words. And, you know, it, it does bring up this question, which words are general and which words are academic? Some of these words are from the general service list and some of these words are from the academic uh, word list. So just take a minute or two to look through it and I'll give you the answers. So um, if we sorted this into general service list and academic word list, then the one, the left two columns are considered general that, you know, every person should know. 
and the ones on the right are considered academic, as in you'd only use them in school. And so, you know, and of course, I, I cherry picked some words that maybe wouldn't fit as well. But this is just to highlight that, you know, this sort of line that we draw between academic and general uh, words is a little bit fuzzier, especially when you use these two lists. Um, another issue that I personally have with the academic word list is not actually that, but often when students learn English, they will learn the first 1,000 words in a general classroom, and then they skip to the academic word list, which then omits, if we go back here, for example, these orange words that are in the upper, two th or upper thousand of the general service list. So we have that sort of hole that's being created if we don't focus on that, if your school uses the GSL and you know the students just skip to the AWL. You have to remember with the AWL, it, it's resting on the supposition that you are teaching the students the first 2,000 uh, GSL words first. So they assume that you've already taught them all of those important words, and now they're ready for these extra words. So anyway, a lot of questions uh, raised with this. And that's sort of what a lot of people know, but the history continues. So then we've got uh, Bilo, Roglu, and Newfield list. I'm going to really should check that pronunciation. Um, it was created in 2008. So this is eight years after the academic uh, word list. This one spikes up to 2,712 word families compared to the you know, 570 of the academic word list. And this is what they use as their source, the corpora. The GSL word families, the AWL word families, the first 2,000 words of the Brown corpus, the first 5,000 words of the BNC, maybe lemmas, we're not sure. Uh, the 1995 Bowman, Bowman revision of the GSL, the Longman wordwise commonly used words, and the Longman defining dictionary or, or defining vocabulary. So looking at that, you might say, wow, that's a lot. And that is exactly what this particular list, the BNL, gets criticized for. Um, so core academic words are stirred back in the same old polysemous word soup, where 2,000 or 3,000 general high frequency word families could actually mean something along the lines of 20,000 to 50,000 lexemes. So, you know, this list is nice, but it's just huge. It's huge and a bit general and not as focused as we might expect from a word list. Um, but of course, you know, this is just the criticism. I haven't taken too much of a look at it myself. And um, really, we've started to identify some problems with frequency lists. Like, how do we deal with polysemantic items? You know, a wooden bow versus take a bow. Um, uh, I don't know why I got that message. Um, idioms, how to include them. Multi-word units, like take off, take on, and take up. How do we do this? So we've also started to look at this comparison between the lemma and the word family. So lemma, which is pluralized as lemmata or lemmas, um, is when we separate words into more than just, you know, what do they look like, but also their root meaning. So proceed, the verb to proceed, would be separated from proceeds, the noun. So um, with this transition, we've started to move towards um, the use of lemmas, lemmata, lemmata, uh, for uh, word lists. And we start to see the GSL is being revised. And in fact, you will st uh, find two versions. And I always find this very confusing. So please make sure you know there are two versions. The first, which I prefer, is by uh, Brezina and Gablasova. It's from 2013. It's got lemmas now instead of wordless or words. It uses four corpora and 12 billion words. Version B is created by Brown, Colligan, and Phillips, actually created just a few months before the other one, which doesn't help with the confusion. This one has words, not lemmas, um, and they use the Cambridge English corpus for this one. My only question mark for the version B is um, this one doesn't have much documentation as to how it was created. Version A was 
put through the standard, you know, academic process. Version B, I haven't found too much. Last I checked, there was just a small snippet from a conference in Japan. So I'm still waiting to find out more information about that. Um, oh, yeah, question. Are most of the lists gathered from spoken or written language? Almost always they're going to be spoken, or sorry, written. There are some that focus more on spoken, like up to 30%. Um, and again, it's the corpus that's that's based. it's based on. But I don't think there's been any list that specifically looked at you know, spoken word lists. Instead, they just are drawn from spoken corpora. Um, so um, going back to the Brezina and Gablasova list, here are just some examples. Um, you know, they view local as more useful than mother, which I wouldn't have expected, or the noun range is used more than walk. And, you know, if you look at lists, and I'm not going to say one is better than the other, but if you look at lists, you might find some interesting ways of looking at language. You know, we have these sort of assumptions that we bring with us that these are easy words that they need to know, and these are more complex words. But sometimes a, a different word list can really be helpful for helping us sort of reanalyze and refocus uh, our attention on the words that we're choosing. And this brings me to the final list I'm going to focus on, the academic vocabulary list. This is created by Davies and Gardner, and they're, again, from uh, BYU, those, uh, the university in charge of all those corpora. This one was created in 2013. And unlike the academic word list, um, this one is much bigger with 1,991 lemmas. Um, and it uses words from COCA, that corpus I'm going to show you guys in a bit. And what is interesting about this one is it mentions fields of use. So if you're in English for specific purposes, it will tell you which words are more likely to be used in economics versus science versus uh, sociology. So that's very helpful for sort of sorting that way. Um, and here's just an example of, you know, what an entry looks like in the academic vocabulary list. So um, these numbers are how, how often it was found. And then they sort them down to related words. So you might not be able to read this, but for example, developmental, which is an adjective, is more commonly used in education. Um, so it's a lot of data, and I think one of the issues with academic vocabulary list is it's so new, we have just barely started to use it, you know, and incorporate it into usable forms. Um, you know, I used to have to go right to the article to find it, but you're starting to see more websites online, you know, using it and incorporating it. And there's more. The list just keeps going. You know, if I present this in two years, I would have even more to talk about. For example, the me medical academic vocabulary list, Brown, Culligan, and Phillips, the ones who made that second version of the GSL. Um, they also have a business service list, fitness English list, and so on. Um, so there's, there's more out there. This is not comprehensive, but I tried to focus on sort of the bigger players in the field right now. So just in summary for the word lists, the general trend seems to have been to move from words to lemmas. Um, there's a lot of contention over word lists, right? So every list will likely have some drawbacks. And I think it's important to sort of consider those drawbacks when you choose to adapt a list for your classroom. And also try to keep an eye out for new lists because right now my favorite are the NGSL and the AVL, but maybe in five years, there's gonna be something better that sort of addresses some of these problems that we've run across. And of course, there's also the issue of reality, which is we are often constrained to textbooks, which are almost all embedded in the academic word list and West's 1953 general service list. So there's only so much you can do if you're being, you know, if you, the materials here are already very enmeshed with word lists. But you also want to think what fits you and your teaching strategy. You know, if you check out the university word list and you love it, well, maybe that's going to match you more as a teacher, even if it's not as common now. Now, this brings me to the last section of my lecture, which is resources. So what are some online resources that students can use to uh, learn vocabulary and that you can use to help them? So the first thing is um, an Excel sheet that I have made. 
It's, um, it generates self-study grammar worksheets with answer keys. You can incorporate any vocabulary you want into it. And it, it uses cycles and repetition um, to uh, help the students drill and practice two things at the same time, verb tenses and uh, vocabulary. You can say, I want them to practice simple present with vocabulary from week five, for example, and it will do that. It also works students' names in and so on. Um, I will send you a link with how to download that in a bit. But I do like this one better for in paper, actually, this one. But you can send it to students as a resource for them to print out. Um, so you type in the vocabulary you want to use. And then these are the types of worksheets it spits out. Again, with the answer keys, I think it's very important so students can self-correct. Vocab Boost, brand new extension, only a month old, I think. Um, so this is a Chrome or Firefox extension that generates self-correcting vocabulary quizzes. Students can use close answers or drag and drop. So if you look at the example here, it's turned a Wikipedia article into a vocabulary quiz. Um, it's really great, you know, I've, uh, the person who's in charge of it, very receptive to feedback because it's so new. So if you try it and you have a suggestion and you contact them, there's a very good chance they will include it in their next update. It's good for students who want more vocabulary practice and who enjoy quizzes. You, it's good for self-study, but you can also use it with the class for a full class warm up. You know, you just pick an article push this and the students coach you into which words go where. Um, Anki flashcards or Anki droid. So it's just a flashcard website, but what I like about this one is it makes it really easy to collect decks. Um, it uses spaced repetition to help students focus on difficult new words. And it's got both an online version and a mobile app version. And it's good for students who want to collect words for self-study, and there are many pre-made flashcard sets. So they don't have to put in the flashcards themselves. There are thousands and thousands of decks online. They just bring them into their set and they can just study with them. And what makes this useful is instructors can also create and distribute sets for students to add to their decks. You'll say, oh, here's this week's vocabulary. You know, you send it to them and they add it to their vocabulary study deck. Youglish. If you haven't used it yet, this website scans the internet to give multimodal examples of words and phrases in authentic contexts. So it's for students who want examples on word use. Um, so if you look at this example, they're showing um, comfortable examples. And so it says one sentence with the word comfortable, and it's got 9,406 video examples of the word comfortable being used in a sentence. So I find students really like this website because they just push play and it just gives them example after example. It has both the text and the audio. So it's really great for learning. And it can also be used in class as a way to collaboratively guess word meanings. Closemaster is a website that gamifies a vocabulary study and also includes multimodal practice. It has both audio and writing practice and it has an app and this is for students who want to study on the go and who like playing games. Um, very straightforward. You don't have to do anything. This one is completely self-study. Finally, COCA. And if you, you maybe you've attended workshops on this, I could give a thousand on it. It's an incredibly interesting tool. It's a fast way to analyze the use of words in American English. And it's got dozens of helpful search tools and options. It's for students who want detailed explanation on a word. It offers self-study and it provides in-depth information about word use, including by genre, year, collocation, and associated terms. So I have students that always ask me, how do I know the register of a word? And COCA is always my best answer there, where if it's used in TV more, and if it's used in you know uh, informal blogs more, it's probably less formal. And if it's used more in academic journals, probably it's more formal. So it's nice because normally there's not much of a resource out there for, because you know, register can be sort of a sliding scale and this helps them measure that. So just as an example of how you could use COCA, um, I had many students struggle with the structure 
noun plus where or when. Like, this is a time when. This is a place where. And so on. Because sometimes we use it in less predictable ways. So I went to COCA and I searched noun plus where to find all examples of the word of a noun being used in front of where. And then I could make an easy list of words that are used before where, um, and I could give this list to students, like point, but it just began to wear on me to the point where I could no longer breathe. And of course, it has thousands of examples for these uses. Um, also, COCA has an AVL COCA combination where you can punch in text, and you probably have already seen this with AWL. Um, and this one will give you sort of a readout on you know, the words that are included and what field they're more likely to be used in. So we can see that mapping is more likely to be used in science and electronically. Um, so if you analyze text, this is what it looks like to you as a reader or teacher. And finally, the older version or an older resource is the Compliant Lexical Tutor created by Tom Cobb. And there's a presentation for BCTL that you can access online. And this one has lots of interaction with the older word lists, especially the um, GSL. Um, we can also see some corpora here that he's in incorporated like the BNC and the BNC COCA. Um, of course, this website is a little bit more complicated to use. So I do recommend checking out that lecture. Whew, that was tough for time. I am done. Any questions? that I can help with. Okay. Um, I've put a link in here, uh, English practice. It's just where I've put all the resources I was just talking about. Um, I'm also gonna put the PowerPoint here for people who um, weren't able to access the full, full version of the PowerPoint. No questions? I feel like I'm talking to my students right now. No yes. questions. You provided all the information. So, you know. I was 100% comprehensive. Talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and definitely, you know, if you're interested in this, please do get involved. You know, it's a really interesting field of corpora and word lists. And I would love to hear more opinions and more critiques and more more ways to use these and incorporate them. Um, again, they are newer, but I really feel it can they can be very helpful for our instruction by refocusing to maybe a word list that might fit us better as instructors and just looking more critically at it. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for coming and um, feel free if you've got questions later on, you can always contact me. Uh, All right, I think we're, I think our presentation ended. Thanks so much for coming.